Uh, Father God, we, uh, we've all uh, come in from a full day, uh, some of us on two wheels, screeching around a corner. And we just ask, Lord, that we, uh, we would just take a breath. That we would just take a second and, and kind of let the day settle down in here. That this would, that this would be a time to um, sit and learn, um, but that it would be time well spent. And so we would not put this as one more thing we had to do today, but something that we actually can look forward to uh, taking a journey together. We ask that your presence would be here, Lord, and I ask uh, that every marriage and every relationship that is represented in this room, Lord, uh, that you would do a new thing. You tell us in your word that you want to do a new thing in our lives, uh, and the day is new every time the sun comes up. And so, Lord, we ask even now that you begin uh, to do a new work in each relationship. And for those that are here and they are single, I ask, Lord, that this would be very meaningful for them as they learn things before they ever even take that step into beginning a relationship, and there would be some really good knowledge that comes from that. We love you. We praise you. uh, We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to do just the, oh, such a short uh, little recap of last week. I I have a, a toolbox here because every week there's going to be a tool that's put in your toolbox. Because if you have something that you need to work on at home and you pull out a toolbox and it's empty, what are you going to do? Well, that's true of your marriages and your relationships too. And so last week I talked about um, that your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend is not your first love and is not supposed to be your first love. That that is, uh, Jesus is supposed to be your first love. And with that relationship and you're working on that, you're going to get most of your needs met from that relationship, which means that this relationship is just bonus material and you're not putting so much pressure on your spouse or your significant other. And so I I pulled out a Bible to kind of represent that, that Jesus is your first love. Uh, So that's in the toolbox. We're going to have something different this week. Um, But to get rolling, I want you to think about weddings. And so to think about weddings, uh, I've got this little video that I would love for you to watch. And then we will talk about that. After all this time, it's still hard for me to fathom that God loves me enough to give me you, a man who has promised to love me. Oh God, here we go. Okay. Today I'm promising you I'll always fart for you. There it is. There's the YouTube. Here we go. Okay, no. I hope not. Today, no. You require so much, but you give so little. Wait. Sorry. I vow not to grow old together. Oh, excuse me. I... <laughs> sure, it's not too late. <laughs> so I place this ring on your finger. So place this thing on your ring. <laughs> as I place it. As a... It's okay. Loving all I know of you and trusting what I do not yet know. I already forgot it. (laughs) English is my second language, you know? (laughs) Thought that I may have found the woman of my dreams. It's just Scott, it's not me. According to the traditions. According to the <laughs> traditions. Just because your rabbi gets for clamped, you don't have to stop. I need my tap stick. It was right. And I'll be here forever. Give me a kiss. Oh, wait, I can't kiss you yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> You had to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't kiss you. I can't go to kiss her. Uh-huh. No. <laughs> <laughs>
to go together. Nice. As I place this ring on your finger. <laughs> you require so little, but you give so much. I wouldn't be marrying you if you did the other one. For your heart, I will fight for your heart. All right. That's good. That's better. Does that got you all in the, you got weddings on the brain? I know we have at least one couple in here that's getting married very soon and um, practice your words. Practice, your, I do this, I do exercises, practice your words. <laughs> we'll be waiting for a, a YouTube video. <laughs> so that was just a little funny to get you uh, thinking about weddings because we're actually gonna talk about weddings a little bit tonight. Um, I am going to teach mostly on uh, some of the content of the book, especially from chapter three, so I hope that you were able to read that. It'll be uh, just a review then for a lot of you. Others, uh, it might be brand new material. And then Bud is gonna teach as only Bud can do. Was that a good, was that a good intro for you? <laughs> so, uh, the first thing I want to talk about from that, I, I pulled a couple really, really important things uh, from chapter three, and we're talking about covenant. And so uh, one of the really important things is that um, there, there is a worldly idea of marriage, and there is a Christian idea of marriage. And a, a lot of times anymore, those are, those are getting very blurred where they're almost the same thing. And so a worldly idea of marriage is um, you fall in love and you just want it to be like that forever. And, and so you're ready to get married. And that really isn't the biblical motto. Of course, love is the centerpiece of that, but that is not the only thing. And what Christian marriage has is a covenant. And covenant is just different then I'm in it for uh, what you can do for me and more of a consumer mindset because that's how everything else is in the world. How many of you would go to work every day and do all of your work that you do now and you didn't get paid anything? Larry. Oh, Larry, St. Larry back there is the only one in the room that would, that would do anything. We are used to doing something and getting something for it. And a lot of the idea of going into marriage now is what can this person do for me? And that's a consumer mindset, but we are gonna focus totally on covenant. And so I'm gonna, uh, there's several quotes that I wanna read from the book uh, that are very good as we think about the beginnings of covenant. So just to kind of introduce that, how is this, how is Christian marriage supposed to be different? And did anybody even teach us before we got married that Christian marriage is different than just we love each other and we want all the legal benefits of marriage. So I'm gonna look at, and you're, I'll tell you where I am and you're welcome to, to follow along, maybe highlight this in your book if you haven't, or you can just listen. I'm going to the bottom of page 83 uh, and I'm gonna read up into page 84. Western societies, of course that's us, make the individual's happiness the ultimate value. And so marriage becomes primarily an experience of romantic fulfillment. But the Bible sees God as the supreme good, not the individual or the family. And that gives us a view of marriage that intimately unites feelings and duty, passion and promise. So I want you to start getting that in your mind. Um, feelings and duty, passion and promise. Okay, this is, this is the very beginning as we talk about covenant. That is because at the heart of the biblical idea of marriage is the covenant. Throughout history, there have always been consumer relationships. Such a relationship lasts only as long as the vendor meets your needs at a cost acceptable to you. If another vendor delivers better services or the same services at a better cost, you have no obligation to stay in a relationship to the original vendor. In consumer relationships, it could be said that the individual's needs are more important than the relationship. And I'm sure many of you know and perhaps have even experienced what that's like to be in a relationship 
um, or seen somebody you know and loved that was not permanent. And honestly, they might have gone into it without the intention that it was going to be a permanent thing. It was good because they went into marriage and the expectation was, I'm going to feel exactly like I do on my wedding day for the rest of my life. And that just is not true. But when you can go into the covenant of marriage, you can actually have something that's better than the day you got married. A love that is much richer and deeper and more profound than the day that you got married, but it's not going to be like that. Then let me go down to the bottom of page 84. Today, we stay connected to people only as long as they are meeting our particular needs at an acceptable cost to us. When we cease to make a profit, that is, when the relationship appears to require more love and affirmation from us than we are getting back, then we cut our losses and drop the relationship. There's somewhere in this, I think it's in this book, I've listened to lots and lots of podcasts, Dr. Keller's podcasts and sermons and other things, but I think it's in this book. He actually had a woman come in for counseling and she said, um, I am not happy in my marriage and I want to get a divorce. And Dr. Keller asked her, um, why did you get married to this gentleman? And she said, because he was hot. Now that that's like seems like a real extreme example and is funny, right? People get married for less reasons than even that. We we are going for uh, we have something in our mind. This is what I want. This is what I'm looking for, and I want that, and I want it to always be like that. And if it's not always like that, I'll go get what I want. And that sort of, that swirls around out in the world and it tries to creep through the doors and influence us in Christian marriage as well. But there's a quote in the very middle of page 84 and if you have notes here, a uh, notebook or anything, I want you to, in addition to just highlighting this, I want you to write it down because it's super important and it's this line. In a covenant, the good of the relationship takes precedence over the immediate needs of the individual. In a covenant, this is in the very middle of 84, in a covenant the good of the relationship takes precedence over the immediate needs of the individual. Now for some of you, you may be sitting here and go, I get that. And for some of you, you may be going, I never heard that in my life. That seems like a strange thing. It should be over what is the good of the relationship. How do I feel? If I feel good, if I feel in love, and our feelings, our feelings, our feelings lead everything that we do. And if that happens, at some point, we're going to get in a little bit of trouble. So that's just a little tiny bit of uh, the idea of consumer uh, relationship versus covenant relationship. Uh, and now I'm just going to spend the rest of my time tonight, uh, and, and then I will, I will do something different at the end, um, talking about just the covenant of marriage. And I'm, and I'm going to explain that in a couple different ways. I'm going to explain it with words, and I'm going to explain it with a visual that will help you understand what happens. So I told you I wanted you to think about weddings. Anybody been to a wedding very recently? Okay, some of you have been to one very recently. You may think about your own if you are married. Uh, some of you that are single have probably been to a wedding. Um, I have done some of the weddings in this room. Bud has done some of the weddings in this room. Um, some of you may have had some really interesting kind of ceremonies that you want to do some really cool stuff. Others may have had a very traditional wedding. But I think something that we have really not done a good job explaining in Christian marriage is the ceremony itself. And to be honest with you, most of the weddings that I either am involved with, attend, anything else, there is a ton of preparation put on several things. There's a ton of preparation put on the party afterwards. The reception is a big deal. I mean, all kinds of stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. You gotta have the cake, and you gotta have all the stuff, and you gotta have the music, and you gotta have this and that. And another thing is pictures, right? You wanna remember this day forever until you don't wanna remember it anymore. 
And then the attire. This is super important, right? What are we going to wear? And all oh, the hides dress and all those things are important. But what I have seen is the thing that gets the very least attention is the ceremony. And what I'm going to tell you, the ceremony is it. Everything else is just a celebration of something that happens in that moment. And I think that there are times in life where the veil between heaven and earth get very thin. One of those is death. One of them is communion. And the other one is at weddings. Because something profound in the history of the world and our relationship with God is happening in that moment. So you may have, you know, you can remember as you're thinking through it, you're like maybe sitting here trying to think of your own wedding and what was the order of things and, you know, the, the wedding party comes in and then everybody stands up when the bride comes and there, there's a beginning, there might be a little music or whatever and there's this <gasps> moment when the bride sees her betrothed waiting at the altar and that beautiful moment. Uh, but then there's something that has to happen. Now, I brought my little, um, this is my folder that I always do weddings with, and I just put the last one I did in, in the very front, and then the others are stacked behind it. So uh, Dakota, yours and Talia's is the, is the last wedding I did, almost, almost a year, right? Ready to celebrate one year, yeah. Um, and before, usually there's some welcome, but then there's going to be something, I call it a charge. Do you call it a charge, bud, or what do you call it? He doesn't even call it anything. <laughs> and now when um, bride and groom want to, sometimes they want to write their vows, special little things, and it's all super teary and emotional, but before they ever face each other at a wedding, they're pointed at me or whoever is marrying them. And there's a charge given. And see, I have tons of different vows in here that different couples have done, but the charge is always the same. And, and this is what I'll say. I'll say, will you take as your wife or your husband, um, will you guard her heart? Will you love, honor, and cherish her? Will you be generous in your forgiveness? Will you remain faithful to the commitments you make today? And then I say that to the wife, and I say that to the, to the husband, and they answer, I will. Right, everybody's familiar with that. They're not facing each other because they're not making a promise to each other. In those moments, I stand in or Bud stands in or whoever marries you stands in as the representative of God in that moment and you are promising God something. Now, it's not lost on any of us that the day you get married, you feel madly in love with the person you're marrying. And so you make promises that day because you feel it that day, but you're not making promises for that day. You're making promises for 10 years down the road and 20 years down the road, and when one of you loses your job and when something goes wrong and you're at odds about something and you don't even know if you can stay together, you're making promises to God. So you're, you're making a vertical promise this way. And then after that's done, there may be some, a song or something, but usually then the pastor would say to the couple, face each other. And so they turn. And that's when they say their vows to each other. So they've just said promises to God. Now they say promises to each other. Do you see what shape this makes? The cross. And the promises can't be made to each other until the promises are made to God. And both have to happen. And both have to happen in Christian marriage. I cannot legally marry somebody without giving that some kind of a charge that you will ask those questions. I'm, I'm bound by not only law in Tennessee, but I am bound by uh, what God asks me to do. So you are making these kinds of beginnings of promises because we were made to be people that make promises. People that make promises. Now I'm gonna do a couple of quotes from this book. I'm gonna talk about them while I read them. And uh, so this one is on page 91. Page 91 in your book, near the top. Wedding vows are not a declaration of present love, 
but a mutually binding promise of future love. A wedding should not be primarily a celebration of how loving you feel now. That can safely be assumed. Rather, in a wedding, you stand up before God, your family, and all the main institutions of society, and you promise to be loving, faithful, and true to the other person in the future, regardless of undulating internal feelings or, ex or external circumstances. You see, if we only get married with the love that's the feeling. We won't be able to stand. We have to marry with the love that is the law, that is the promise, that is the action, that is the I will do this. And so you begin to see why you can't just, you can't just jump into marriage. You can't just be like, oh yeah, let, let's just do this as believers. Because there are deep, deep commitments we're making here, right? I'm talking to, <laughs> I'm doing, I'm not pointing you out terribly. You don't have to stand up and jump around. But I'm doing Joshua, this is Bud's son, Joshua, and his bride, Kelsey. I'm doing their premarital counseling right now. So they're sort of getting this session with everybody else. So see, you don't have to come and sit in my office for this one. You just, just, you just get it right here. And that is a really good thing. But you're making decisions that are promises, that are promises. Let me read one more quote and then I'm gonna show you a visual that I think is gonna, is gonna help make sense for you of all of this. And that's on page 101 up at the top. Well, I'm actually gonna start at the bottom of page 100 and go into that. What you think, this is the bottom of 100, what you think of as being head over heels in love, this is when you get married, is in large part a gust of ego gratification. But it's nothing like the profound satisfaction of being known and loved. When over the years someone has seen you at your worst and knows you with all your strengths and flaws, yet commits him or herself to you wholly, it is a consummate experience. Listen to this real carefully. To be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. And a lot of times when, when the, the person you marry, you think you know them really well, but you know what you want to know of them and you know what you think they are and who you think they are, but you're still not to the place of really knowing. It takes many years and it takes many hard, hard things Ryan insists that he doesn't care whether the toilet paper goes over the top or underneath. <laughs> I want it over the top. Everybody knows that. And he says he doesn't care, but every time he changes it, he always puts it underneath. <laughs> this is a very funny issue, but you start to realize that when you're dating and when you're trying to woo a prospective husband or wife, what are you showing each other your very best, right? You're never going to do some of the things you would do at home uh, with your husband and wife at, as when you're trying to get somebody. You're trying to make a good impression. But it's when you can truly be yourself. When your spouse sees you on days where you're sobbing or you're miserable or you're angry at the world or you're broken and they still love you. This is when you start to understand covenant. So, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. And so we run to relationships and we run to marriage because we want to be loved. We don't want to be known and then rejected. But sometimes we have to give a little more time to really understand that. But to be fully known like all your little secrets that you don't let anybody else see, to be fully known and truly loved at the same time. You're not putting your best foot forward anymore. They're seeing you for who you really, really, really are. And they still love you. Well, that's a lot like being loved by God. 
It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. Basically, covenant is going to hold when love falls short. I made a promise. I made a promise to God, and I made a promise to my spouse. And sometimes when that's all you can hold on to, that'll carry you through till the love comes flooding back in. I want to show you a visual now, and I have asked for a lovely assistant, Lauren. Would you come up and help me with said exercise? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, show you something. Uh, so this is going to, we'll have this cord represent the groom getting ready to get married. Oh, I went very traditional with my colors. So blue is for the groom, pink is for the bride. This is going to represent uh, them standing at their wedding. Now, they can get married and not have covenant. But to have covenant, there has to be one more piece in this. And so I'm going to have this cord represent God. And this cord is bigger than the other two. This cord has a beginning that's before bride and groom were ever born. And God continues on after bride and groom end. Lauren, you can do a braid, right? Of course. The, the hair queen of the world, yes, uh, can do. I, I want, I'm going to hold this end, and I want you to just start to braid just, just for a second. Uh, and then I will tell you when I want you to stop. Do that nice and tight. Okay, stop for, stop for just a second. So this is what happens in a marriage uh, a wedding ceremony. You're putting God, and you notice I put God in the middle. And then put him out to the side. This is what's going to bind together. If we just bound the blue and the pink together, it could easily unravel. But it's bound this way. Now on your wedding day, when your wedding day's over and you're at the party and you're having all fun and getting your pictures made and, I don't know, doing all kinds of whatever dances and whatnot, you're still like this. It's begun. It's begun, but it hasn't finished. And let me pause right here and say to the single people in the room, okay, especially if there's young single people in the room and you're just starting to date or you haven't dated yet or you haven't found that special somebody. When we talk, and you may have heard, uh, Bud and I probably have both talked about it at different times. You may have heard it and uh, Aaron may have talked about, I don't know, uh, about being unequally yoked. Unequally yoked means, and some of you understand that because you married somebody that you might have been a believer and they were not. And you thought, I can get them to the altar. I can change your life. I can get them to where they are. Well, let me tell you what happens at the marriage ceremony. That white piece that's being bound together, that covenant that's being made, one of the two doesn't even believe in the white piece in the middle or doesn't care about that. And the the covenant is not being formed. So when you go to date somebody, one of your very, very first things is not, woo, he's hot, or man, she's whatever you call girl. I don't know, what's the, do you say hot for girls too? Sure, okay, hot. You can say hot for, I don't know, it's been a long time since I dated. Oh. Um, whatever you're saying, you're like, oh, I just, I just want to be with them because they're hot. That is stroking your ego. That's making you feel like, wow, that hottie likes me. I'm going to do everything I can to make them love me. One of the first questions you've got to ask is, do you love the Lord? And do you want a relationship with Him? And if their answer is no, you haven't really connected with them too much yet. Walk away. Well, what if nobody else comes along and he was really hot? Walk away. A few years ago, I had a young lady um, that was recommended to me for counseling. I did not know her. Uh, somebody that goes to church here was friends with this girl's mother. And she was um, in a place that she was suicidal. And they were trying to get an inpatient bed for her anywhere around, and they could not find a bed for her. 
and I tried to make some recommendations and, and it just wasn't working out and I, I finally relented and normally I don't see people that I don't even know the connector to them um, and I said, tell her to come and see me. I can't have somebody that, that wants to end their life and I didn't even know why and she came to see me and she was distraught. She was heartbroken because she was engaged to be married and she ended the relationship because he didn't love the Lord. Their, their wedding was only, I don't know, I think it was, it was beginning to be planned and she broke it off because she knew I cannot, I love him with all that I am and I cannot marry him because he doesn't love what I love most. And it broke her heart and it broke her. And we worked together for a long time, off and on for about a year and a half and I will tell you now, and, and I told her, you know, and she was just, I, I don't know what to do, I don't know how to go on, but I knew I had to do that. Um, she met the one that the Lord intended for her. And she's been married, happily married for a few months now to a man that loves the Lord and that she loves the Lord with him. You cannot, this is not going to form if, if you're the one you love, oh, they're a good guy or they're a good girl, but they're not, they don't have the same fiery passion as you do. And what did I say? You have to have a fiery passion to love Jesus Christ first. If they don't love Jesus Christ first, I told Ryan before we got married and we were asking each other really hard questions and I said, can you deal with the fact for the rest of your life that you're never going to be number one in my eyes? And he said, Yes. And I said, I better never be number one in your eyes either. And that's why our covenant has grown. You gotta have this together. So here's, what's, here's what happens though, because you're like, well, I already married somebody like that. Now what am I supposed to do? Well, that means that you are like this. And so you've been living your married life and you've been trying to keep a relationship with God, but you sure don't want to let your spouse go. So you're going to get pulled one way or the other. Guess where you're going to end up going? Towards your spouse. But you can change all that new because God makes everything new every day. And so you can decide today we're on the same page. We're going to put God first in our lives from this very second forward. And so you might have been like this. But now you're going to be like this, and so the anchor can hold from this end instead of from the very top. But continue to, continue to braid there for me, my dear. Did I unbraid? And so as you see this come together, and as it forms, you can't see all of the pink anymore. And you can't see all of the blue anymore. And really, there's part of the white that represents God that you can't see anymore either. But all three continue to be bound together. And when you reach those moments that everybody does, where you're like, I don't even know if I can sit in the same room with this person or let them touch me. And those, those times can come for a variety of reasons. You're not going to fall apart. And you know why you're not going to fall apart? Thank you, Lauren. You're wonderful. Because of the covenant and you're gonna stay because you made promises and you're gonna lean on the centerpiece of your marriage, which is not your spouse. It is the white piece. You're gonna lean into God and go, man, we are struggling mighty right now, but we lean into God and he will carry you to the next place until the love comes back. So this is our, going in our toolbox for tonight, the covenant is so important. And even if you have not covenanted up until this point, you start right this second, and this begins to happen. Let's pray, and I'm going to turn it, things over to Bud. Lord, we, none of us in here have done things perfectly. A bunch of time we've tried to do it from our own strength. A bunch of times, in honesty, Lord, we've been selfish. We've wanted things our own way. We haven't been happy, and if we haven't been happy, well, God forbid that we stay. 
but we made promises or we're going to make promises. And Lord, if we're ever going to be people of integrity, we have got to hold on to the cord of three strands, the covenant that was made on our wedding day or will be made on our wedding day. And that has to be the centerpiece of everything or the party afterwards and the lovely pictures and the wonderful honeymoon and the pretty clothes aren't going to matter a bit. Lord, in this moment, if we have turned and we have gone our own way a little bit, may we turn back and once again be one of those threads in the cord and let you be wound around as the very centerpiece that holds us together. You didn't tell us it was going to be easy, but when we hold on to our promises and you hold on to us, we will find our way through and find our way into a richer place where we can be fully known and fully loved. And that is the greatest experience that any marriage can ever have. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives and being the centerpiece for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. You're here. Oh, that's yours. So, yeah. I think th this is absolutely amazing, um, the attendance that we have had. We, when we talked about it, we could, you know, we could have uh, five or 50. We could have 20 or 200. No, you know, there's no way of knowing how many we're going to have. I'll try to keep that closer so you're going to be good. Um, and I think it just really shows ways of that God is working, the ways the Holy Spirit is working to bring revival into the church and into believers, into Christians, we've, we've always had an idea of how that, what that looks like. And what I see him doing is absolutely amazing. And it's no wonder we're getting closer as the bride of Christ to being with him to being with the bride, the wedding supper of the Lamb. And so it's no wonder that in this time as we draw up to that, that he is, he is trying to revive Christian marriage. He is trying to revive biblical marriage. He's trying to bring us back so that our mindset, as we prepare for our own wedding day with him, our mindset... Uh, is the is the same kind of mindset that that we're supposed to have um, with him? We it has to start in us. Does that make sense? We're not going to carry a faulty mindset of marriage and then just all of a sudden get into his presence in the marriage supper of the lamb and 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 the wedding feast and all that kind of stuff. And then just all of a sudden we change our mind. It starts here. We have to change our thinking here, change the way we think about marriage here, change the way we see marriage here. And we've used the term Christian marriage for a couple things. The world will never see marriage the way we see marriage. And we may not see marriage the way we're going to see marriage. Because many of us have been taught by the world how marriage functions. Many of us have picked up from the world or, for, or from, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but from parents who, who learn from other parents who did it the way the world does it. And so terms such as covenant are foreign to us, especially when it comes to marriage. And covenant is a binding thing. A covenant is binding so what I want to do, I want to share a, a, a couple things about covenant uh, because I think it's vitally important. So turn with me to Exodus. We're going to start out in, in the book of, well, turn with me to uh, Genesis. For, well, turn with me to the book of... <laughs> da, 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 da. Uh, I'm trying to figure out where I'm going. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 17. I think, I think that's where we're going to go to. Genesis chapter 17. We're going to talk about one of the covenants. Uh, there are other covenants in Scripture, and 
the thing that you find out about covenants is that, that when God had a covenant, there was always blood required. Uh, death was required at times. And all of that foreshadowing for us the final covenant that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ in our life now. That final covenant that we are to have with him. And we're going to look in a few minutes how that represents back to marriage. It is a covenant. It is a binding uh, agreement between two people if you will have that. And there are some things that make it really, really binding. I was looking over the group to decide just how far I will go with what I'm going to share with you. <laughs> and I'm trying to see, do we have, how, do we have any, uh, anybody under 18 with us? Do we have anybody under 25? Okay. Okay. Well, y'all learn more in middle school than we ever knew in high school. See anything? Um, look at, uh, I'm, uh, if, you have, if you have your Bibles, if not, just listen as I read it. When, this is chapter 17, verse 1, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will, listen to this, then I will make my covenant between me and you. And will greatly increase your numbers. Now I want you to notice we, as we read this. He's saying, I'm going to make a covenant with you. And, and one of the parts of this covenant is that you are going to experience blessings. Because of your entering a covenant. He didn't say you're going to be perfect. He said you're going to experience blessings by entering covenant. But you don't get to some blessings without going through the rough parts. Am I right about that? He said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Listen, if, you're, if you have your Bible and you want to circle, circle every time you see the words, I will. How many of you know when, when Chris is talking about the marriage ceremonies, the word I will or I do comes up. And so here's God saying in our, in our marriage, he, he's telling us what he will do. And so he says, I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after for generations to come uh, to be your God and the God of your descendants. So he said, when you enter a covenant with me, and again, we're going to relate this back to marriage. When you enter a covenant with me, this is a lifetime covenant, and it doesn't only affect you, but it affects your children, and it affects your grandchildren, and it affects generations to come. Can you imagine the impact of your life and my life when we see marriage as a covenant and we understand it as a covenant, and a covenant that is involved of involving two people in God? Marriage is a covenant that God instituted, so it is a covenant that involves three people, right? Can you imagine just in your family alone how many generations could see marriage correctly, could see marriage the way God built marriage and enjoy marriage the way marriage is supposed to be built just because you chose to walk in your, co in your marriage in covenant, does that make sense? And he said, I'm, I'm going to bless you. Um, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for generations to come. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as, as a foreigner, I will give as everlasting possessions to you and your descendants after you. And I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant and your descendants after you for generations to come. So he's saying, we're entering into a covenant here, but we both have some things to do. Did you hear that part? We both have some things to do in a covenant. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. 
the covenant that you are to keep. <clears throat> Here's where it gets somewhat painful. We're putting nothing in the toolbox tonight from this, so, you know, just <laughs> hang with me here. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You're to undergo circumcision, and it will be a sign of the what? The covenant. It will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. For generations to come, every male among you who is eight years old uh, must be, or eight years old, must be circumcised. And then he comes down into verse 14 and says, Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken a covenant, or in reality, he, he came up into a family where there's a covenant, and he came to a point in his family where he had to make his own decision if his family had chosen somewhere along the line. Obviously, he was not a baby who entered a covenant. He's older in life and about to enter a covenant, but he has to make the choice as he came here. Now, I want you to see this. The covenant of circumcision is a covenant of cutting away of the flesh. Does anybody, anybody understand? We're all, we're all adults here. Most of us know. If you don't, you will someday. But it is a cutting away of the flesh. In, in our relationships in marriage, the biggest issue that you're going to have is your flesh, her flesh, your flesh, getting in the, in the way of what God wants to do, and so there's going to have to be a actually continual cutting away. Now, this was a one-time thing, but there's going to have to be a continual cutting away of the flesh because the flesh is going to want to get in the way of your marriage. You cut away of the flesh. When the flesh is cut away in circumcision, I think y'all can handle this. The head is revealed. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And he will never allow flesh to stand in the way and take his glory. You tracking with me? The covenant of circumcision was not just something God thought up and said, Hey, <laughs> you know what? Why don't we just do this? This is going to be hilarious. <laughs> Nobody thinks that's funny. At least most of us. Um, that was not it. The covenants that God established were covenants that had a message behind them. And the messages were, I have got to be number one in your life. And the one thing that's going to get away of me being on the throne of your life is the flesh getting in the way. You and I in our marriages are going to have to deal with the flesh from day one. How many of you know the flesh has desires? And a lot of times the, fl <laughs> the fleshly desires are not, um, not really godly desires. And so if we're going to walk in covenant with God and we're going to walk in covenant with each other something has to happen that is continually removing exposing removing the flesh out of our life we now because of Jesus have a circumcised heart the flesh cut away from our heart are you tracking with me you can read the scriptures on that one the flesh cut away from the heart Jesus did that but even with that, there's going to be a continual process of us cutting away the things that don't belong. The problem is we have a hard time experiencing pain on our own. So God has to put somebody in our life to make our life painful. And that person is your spouse. And we're just going to dismiss in prayer right there. We're, 
I want to jump over to Ephesians in, in, in a minute in, in, in this part with Ephesians chapter 6 with the, with the true covenant that we have now before God between man and woman and that is the leave and the cleave. That is to leave your father and mother and you cleave to your wife and you become covenant. If you've read your book, you read a section, uh, I think it was in chapter 5, you read a section where um, Tim Keller was talking about his wife had been married to five different people uh, since the beginning. My wife has had at least five husbands, if not more, since we got married. She had, she, and, and even from a physical standpoint, she, she married a husband who was, who, you know, had some muscles and had a whole lot of hair. But, as you see, it didn't go backwards. She has a full-figured man now with a head that she can just shine and rub on anytime she wants to. We change. And how many times do I hear, how, I hear this statement in marriage council, well, she's trying to change me. Thank God. <laughs> He's trying to change me. That is part of the job. That's part of the job in covenant. That's part of the job of God is using that individual to help cut away the flesh. And how many of you know cutting away a flesh can be painful? But there are things in all of our life that, that, we, that will never get cut away until you're married. And I'll tell you why. Because you can run from friends who will tell you the truth. And this is why it has to be a covenant too. Because if we go into a marriage and we go in either romantically infatuated, what happens is, is the end, and I promise you it's going to end. The infatuation is going to end. Now, some of you here, everybody's going to say, oh, there's no way. What I feel, I mean, it's just never going to end. It will end. Infatuation will end. That's when real love gets to kick in. Real love doesn't kick in. Your brain is too messed up during that season. But real love kicks in when you have the opportunity for your marriage to become the beauty of a covenant marriage. But it can be painful because you are marrying someone who is going to change. They're going to change. I am not the same man that I was when Carla and I got married. I hope she would tell you that she loves this man or likes this man better than that man. If we're continuing to try to, to become better and we're allowing our spouse to rub us the wrong way. Imagine if you were a stick. You just go out and cut a tree, cut a limb out of a tree. And it's just a rough, rough limb. And you want this limb to, to be a really nice looking cane for later in life. You know, you're, you know what I'm talking about? A real nice cane. Have you seen those wooden? They're shiny and they look good. But every time you start to sand that stick, it starts whining, saying, you're rubbing me the wrong way. And you're sitting there thinking, if I don't rub you the wrong way, you're never going to be what you could be. So just take it, and I'm going to close in prayer. You, you see what I'm saying? That's what that person is going to help you do. They are a help meet. They are a helper. I think it is so interesting that when God said man needed a helper, okay, i got to read this to you. This is good. This is good stuff. I'm, I've got a clock, Chris. No worries. Um, I've got my little timer on. Um, Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. I love this. Listen to this. Chapter 2, verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And then the next thing that happened, now the Lord had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the wild birds in the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. 
the very first thing God says, it ain't good for you to be alone. Go out there and name the animals. And so in Adam's mind, it's like, yeah, but that just, I don't know. Just doesn't appeal to me, Lord. So the man gave names to all the livestock and the birds and, and, and in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. No suitable helper was found until he makes a woman. And then he, so he took Adam, of course we know, took Eve uh, from Adam's rib. And the man said, now, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. That is why a man, listen, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united in covenant, is united to his wife. And they become one flesh. They become one flesh. That is an amazing principle and truth. That two people become one. You can't run away from yourself. And so in marriage, when we're united in covenant, you come together. And now those two people who come into marriage thinking that it's always going to be like this, if they go in thinking that, not realizing that we're entering into marriage to, to, to have a spiritual friendship where each of us are helping each other move further and further away from the flesh so that Jesus Christ is revealed in our marriage. Can you see that? It's not hitting you the way it did me. I was just like, wow. I love that. I love to see how God can take those two things. You're helping cut away. Carla has helped over the year cut away some of the flesh in me. Because when I get selfish, she is there to remind me. She is there to share with me. And I can get so ticked off or irritated, or I can say God put a helper in my life so that he can help me live out this covenant that he has between us and that we have together. And all of us are headed toward being like him. We're fighting so hard to keep who we are. And how many of you have heard, we used to say this all the time. I don't know if people still use it, but I just need to find myself. That was a thing back in the, I just need to find myself. You are going to be so stinking disappointed. <laughs> I promise you. Stop looking. <laughs> don't waste your time looking. And I know, I know what I need to find myself means. It means I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm 55 years old and I'm on a 60 years old and I'm on a I'm going to get me a button-up shirt and unbutton it down to here and get me a bunch of gold chains and get me a little red sports car and just go out and, and hit the roads and keep the roads hot. You're going to be so disappointed in yourself. You're going to be disappointed in what you find because you cannot find, oh, for, okay, for our singles, God will put you in, let me say this, God will put you in community where people will help you do what I'm talking about. But there is nothing like created on God's earth, like marriage, that God created. He says it. It's the mystery of Jesus and the church. There's nothing ever created more like Jesus Christ and the church than marriage. And it's really because... He created all that so that through the gospel we see a picture of Jesus Christ in the church and we see a picture of marriage. Does this make sense at all? And so the flesh has to be put away. And we're pretty good about hanging on to our flesh. How many of you noticed that when you got married all of a sudden you had your independence and you were doing good, you had this way of life, you were doing it this way, and then you get married, and all of a sudden, 
Somebody is right in the middle of your stuff? That is so uncomfortable, right? But if you go into it with the mindset, marriage is about making me happy and me achieving all of my goals in life and becoming all that I can be, you'll be divorced or miserable. But I think what God's trying to do is send revival into the church and revive marriages again to say marriage doesn't have to be what you've seen out there. Now, there's going to have to be a generation. Listen to me. Listen to this one. There's going to have to be a generation to pay a price. There's going to have to be a generation to pay a price for what we have allowed to happen in marriage. Understand what I'm saying about this. We have done marriage the way the world does it. And the way the world does marriage is it promotes infidelity. And then when the infidelity happens, it curses the people that do it. It's just like saying, come, 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 come. And then when they come, it's like, I can't believe you did. There's a generation alive right now that is going to, you are going to deal or you have dealt with infidelity in your marriage, and if, and if you end the covenant at that point, you will not be able to revive this thing for the next generation. You've got to work through it. Now, if, a, if one or the other ab abandons through it, there's nothing you can do about that. But if there's not abandonment, and if there are two people saying, let's try to work this out, then work it out. Is anybody with me? Work it out. Why? We don't know how to do covenant. We're learning. We've never been taught this. But there are generations to come that we have to pass it on and we've got to pay the price so they don't have to. Somebody's got to stick it out. When somebody strays, you got to stick it out. Oh, oh. I didn't expect this. I'm telling you guys, the Holy Spirit can get you through anything. He will get you through anything. And if you decide ahead of time the things that are going to cause you to jump out when it gets too tough, I promise you, you're going to jump out. But if you go into it with a covenant and you say, oh, Lord, I want to leave so bad. But how many times was I unfaithful to you? And you didn't kick me out. You didn't run me off. You didn't set me aside. You didn't even hate me. Yeah, I didn't like it too good, but you didn't hate me. And he went and paid a price. And you know, when you stick it out, for the sake of the covenant that God put himself in right down in the middle of you. You will be glad you did. I don't know why I ended up this way. For some of you, you've been through it and you've been divorced. And now you're struggling. It's like, ah. Well, I didn't stick it out. Stop it. Don't go there. Where are you right now? We're starting this thing. Didn't, I, didn't we talk about last week we're going to start over? We're going to, we're going to crush it. We're going to take the foundation down. We're going to start to build here. You didn't know the stuff I'm talking to you about 10 years ago. You didn't know the stuff Chris is talking to you about 5 years ago, even 3 years ago, maybe not even a year ago, but we're learning it now. And I promise you, if we take this on, I, I'll, I will help you. Say, bud, there was infidelity and I just can't get beyond it. Call me. 
I will sit down with the two of you and I'll, I'll, I'll help you know how to get through it. Because I want your kids to see. See, I love you. I really love you and I want this for you. But I want, I want it for your kids. I want you to know that when you truly enter into a covenant with the Lord, oh, I don't know why I've just been such a big baby lately. <laughs> when you truly enter into a covenant with the Lord, and you invite him right down in the midst. You're going to change. Haley, when you all got married, Haley didn't even know who she would be in 10 years. I didn't. We get mad at the other person for changing. None of us know who we're going to be 10 years from now. Let's hope that we're all growing toward him, right? Don't we hope that? We're all going, growing toward him. But don't get mad because they're not who you married. It's impossible. If they are the same person that you married, you, that's a whole other problem. Because that means they're not growing at all. That's a sad place to be. There are going to be some rough times. I'm, I want to end with this. There are individual seasons and there are seasons in relationships. When you stick it out and you're going through a very difficult season, you ride that season out for the whole. Because seasons end. Are you tracking with me? Seasons end. But when you ride that out, you end up with a life that is a beautiful life. But if you let a season stop you, you don't get to experience the life, the marriage, the marriage, the whole. I can say everything I've said here because I am 61 years old and I have lived through it all. I've lived through tons of stuff you can't even imagine. And I am more happily married in my life now than I ever imagined that I could be. Covenant. Covenant keeps you going when you don't want to go anymore. It keeps you together when you think you just can't stay. And it helps you get through the seasons so you can experience the whole. Yes, you're not married to who you were married to, and you're not married to who you will be five years down the road. And I'm not talking about another person. I'm talking about in the person that you're sitting with right now. They will change. Hopefully, you're changing each other for the good, and you're helping cut away the flesh so that Jesus Christ, the head of the church, is revealed. Father, I pray over I pray over every family in this room. I, I pray over every marriage in this room. I pray over those whose hearts are hurting because people that they love have given up on marriage. But I pray that you will help them see, Lord, that you can bless them beyond. You can bless their marriage when they get there. And for the people that are going through struggles in this room right now, I pray... Holy Spirit, do something inside of them. You're, you're doing a, a marriage revival, and I am so thankful for what you're doing. We're your bride. Not too long down the road, we're going to be experiencing a beautiful wedding feast in your presence. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Chris. Thank you, bud. I love you.
In case you hadn't picked up on it yet, we, we love marriage. We love your all's marriages or the marriages that are to come. And we're all about supporting those in every way we can. I just want to do just a little recap um, to kind of close out this part on everything that, that Bud said and I said. Um, and, and let me kind of reiterate something he said. Um, this room does not need to be filled with any guilt and shame. Okay? Um, I know that there's people in here that are divorced, remarried. Um, we are focused on the now and making your marriage work now. Don't really need to deal with the past and, and those history things, and we don't want to, but we don't want you to walk out of here with your head bowed low. It's a messy life. And this whole covenant thing, we're all trying to figure it out, as Bud said. Hang in there with us. We, we are establishing in an order. Hope this is going to make sense to you by the end of it when you look back. We started with, what is the first thing you need in your life? You need a relationship with the Lord. It's got to be primary. And now tonight we're talking about this covenant. I want to show you this one more time. This is not going to be broken because it's three. And God can be in the middle of your relationship. If God has not been in the middle, he can be. And you start now. Okay, and I want to read you uh, just one quote. And then we're going to do something just a little bit different to finish out for the evening. And I think this, I think this explains everything really well. I'm going to read uh, the bottom of 116 and the top 117. Many people hear this and say, I'm sorry. I can't give love if I don't feel it. I can't fake it. It's too mechanical for me. I can understand that reaction, but Paul doesn't simply call us to a naked action. He also commands us to think as we act. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This means we must say to ourselves something like this. Well, when Jesus looked down from the cross, he didn't think, I am giving myself to you because you're so attractive to me. No, he was in agony, and he looked down at us, denying him, abandoning him, and betraying him. And in the greatest act of love in history, he stayed. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. He loved us not because we were lovely to him, but to make us lovely. That is why I am going to love my spouse. Speak to your heart like that and then fulfill the promises you made on your wedding day. Stay. Stay. And we're going to give you some tools for that in the weeks to come, and I'm actually going to give you one uh, tonight because as you try to figure out this idea of covenant, uh, what does that mean for me? How do we keep God in the middle, and how do we make this work? You have to have some practical stuff. If you went out right now and you bought a brand new computer of some sort, you'd open it up and there would be some kind of operating system with it, right? So we have an operating system for ourselves in the ways that we love. And so I asked you to read chapter five as well, and I'm not really gonna go over what was in the book on that. You can read that, but I'm going to talk about something related to that. And some of you uh, have probably read, uh, taken the little test for it, uh, the five love languages. You may have heard of that, Dr. Gary Chapman. Now, when I have people come in for premarital counseling or, or marriage counseling or anything like that, I ask them, have you ever read the, the love language, the five love languages? And they're like, oh yeah, I've read it. Well, Ryan and I have read it too, and we're still working on it 28 years later because it's not as easy as it sounds, but you've got to begin with somewhere. 
So for those of you that have not read that or not heard of that, I'm going to give you a website to write, to write down. You can go look it up and you can actually take, it's just, a, I, I took the quiz again today. It came up the same way it always does, but I took the little quiz. It was short, it was really easy. Gives you a little graph at the end, but it is uh, five, the number five, love languages, all one word, dot com. Pretty easy, right? Five love languages, dot com and just hit the link that says take the quiz. Doesn't cost anything. I don't think I've gotten any weirdo spam or anything from it. But there, every one of us has a main operating system in how we receive love best. That we know that somebody loves us. Now I'm gonna tell you what the five of these are. And you may be able to you know, know it right off the bat. Go, oh yeah, that's me. That's me, there's a primary one. So let me just go over those and I'm gonna say a few things. Uh, the first one, the first love language you might have is gifts. You might feel most loved uh, when somebody gives you tangible and intangible items that make you feel appreciated or noticed. Okay, we're not going to take this to some weirdo level here and say, I have to have a sports car every day or I have to have some kind of diamond jewelry every day to know that you love me. That's not what we're talking about. But little, little trinkets, little special things that are, maybe that's what makes you feel loved. Oh, that's so sweet. The second one is acts of service. Perhaps the way that you feel loved is when somebody or your significant other does things for you without being bullied, asked, or beaten over the head with a stick. <laughs> the stick you make a cane in, that you make a cane with. Um, doing something helpful or kind for your partner. That's acts of service. That may be, oh, that's how I feel love. Okay. The th number three is quality time. Quality time. A time when both people are present without distraction. I know if you got little kids and <laughs> right now you got no quality time right now, your wife's not even in here. Poor little Haley. We called it. We knew it was going to be you all. They were the oh, that's our number again. It's hard to do, right? For those of you with the little kiddos, it, it can be really hard to do, but quality time doesn't have to be hours on end. Quality time can be just a few minutes here, there, anywhere where you're like, you put your phone down for one. You pay attention, you turn the TV volume off, you listen to each other, you spend time doing something that you like to do together. So maybe that's your way. Oh yes, I know I'm loved because you know, my, my partner did, did this with me. Number four is physical touch, okay? Physical expressions of love, okay? This does not say your love language is sex, okay? We're gonna have a whole session, session five, we're gonna talk about sex. We're not gonna do that tonight, but this does not necessarily mean that. It can involve that, but you can't be like, honey, that's the way I feel love, so come on. <laughs> it's not what I'm talking about here, okay? There has to be other kinds of ways that you show affection without starting the cycle of, you know, lift off. Oh, did I say lift off? I shouldn't have said lift off. That was bad. That was so bad. Some things come out my mouth before, oh, now everybody's gonna be here for session five because they're gonna be like, I can't wait to see what both of them have to say that. Night. It could be a hug, it could be hand holding, it could be something like that. Is that the way that you feel loved? Okay, and the last one is words of affirmation. Words of affirmation, verbal expressions of care and affection. Okay, so maybe you have an inkling of, yeah, I know that that's mine, or maybe you wanna go in and that little quiz is very easy, it won't take you five minutes. But here's the, here's the idea, and this is a tool to help you. I want you to figure out what yours is, okay? and then I want you to tell your spouse or your boyfriend, girlfriend what yours is. Because here's the problem that Ryan and I have been trying to work on for 28 years. His love language, the way he receives love most is acts of service. My love language, the way I know I'm loved is words of affirmation. So I forget and I assume that everybody else has the same operating system I have. So I offer Ryan these great words of affirmation. I'm like, you're the best guy, you go, you go, and he doesn't feel loved. 
But one night I took, I took the trash out and took the can all the way to the top of the driveway and he cried like a baby. <laughs> he did, he did. <laughs> he did, you can go out, he's working with your kids right now. You can ask him, yes I did, because I knew, he was like, honey, because that's how he experiences love. But I experience love through words of affirmation. So he goes out and spends all day detailing my car and I'm like, thank you. And I go on, because I'm looking for, oh, you did such a good job today, huh? You're just so good. You're just, I'm waiting for those words. And we tend to do what ours is. In 28 years, we've been working on this. And we know this, and we've read the book. So you can say, I've read the book. Yeah, I'm good at it. You still end up wanting to do your own. Now, here's the problem. One of the places we have to go is they're doing the best they can, maybe. And you've got to show some appreciation for what they are doing. But I want you to know what yours is and what your other person's is. And I want you then to start using your brain and your heart to think of how can I show this to them. And I want you to not just do a simple, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll buy the gas station flowers on the way home. I want you to get a little creative and spend a little time to try to do what's going to mean something to the other person. And then I want you to appreciate what your spouse does for you. Now, this is important. So this is your homework for this week. Now, we're taking last week's homework. I hope that you continue. I hope you prayed for each other. I hope you always now... We'll just, we ripped off the band-aid last week that you will ask your spouse or your boyfriend, girlfriend, fiance, whoever it might be, and say, what do you need? Because I want to lift that up to the Lord. I hope you do that all the time. You want that covenant to grow strong? You want Jesus to be in the middle? You got to do some things. But then you find out what your love language is. Take that little quiz. If you don't know, it'll give you like a chart. Sometimes you have a, my second one is actually um, uh, quality time. So you're going to have a first and a second that are important to you, and some of the other ones are not so important. But you learn to appreciate what little bits they might do. But you've got you to gotta make yourself do what they want and not how you would do it. You can't do what you want to receive. You've got to do what they will do. Does that, does that make sense to you? Okay, and for some of you that were just like, cringing last week when I had you jump into a book in chapter three. How dare I not start on page one? <laughs> and so you had to read it in order. Then you're good because for next week, you're going to read chapters one and two. And so some of you are like, yes, yes, I get bonus time. And we next week are going to talk about service, what it means to be a husband and wife, what it means to not have it all about you. Because as, as God is trying to present a representation, we have to learn that all of us in this room at our base, base levels, the flesh, we're selfish. We think about, who do we think about the most? And so marriage is learning to think about somebody else. And it's, it's hard. I'm not going to love them because they didn't love me. I'm not going to do this for them because they didn't do this for me. And what does God say about it? And how do we serve each other even if they aren't serving us? So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some more things in the weeks to come. Um, I want you to have some hope for where your relationships are. I know there's some great marriages in here. And some of y'all are doing really, really um, good. You understand a lot of this stuff. But some of you are going to be in a struggle place. And you're like, oh. This is really hard. So the point in the last couple minutes, I want you to take away, I'm going to go back to that very first thing I talked about, a consumer relationship versus a covenant. A consumer relationship is like, I'm in it and I made all those promises until it gets hard and it's inconvenient for me. And when it's not exactly like it was in the beginning and I don't have all that, wow, that electric energy going, I'm going to leave and I'm going to go find it with somebody else. But let me tell you what happens if you leave. You're going to keep leaving and leaving and leaving because you will find yourself, that just wears off. The electric nature wears off. That what, it, what was the word you used? Infatuation? Is that what you used? Yeah, when you're all just like, it's going to wear off. 
And if you keep running because you're like, I have to have this to make me feel good about myself, you will be doing that the rest of your life. And instead, you stay. You hold the line. You get tools in your toolbox. You keep working on your relationship with the Lord. And he's going to start doing some things. Okay? So, closing prayer. Father, we ask for safe travel home tonight. We ask, Lord, that you would show us what is our operating system? What is the way that we most feel loved? And then, Lord, I'm going to ask that you impress it deeply on our partners, on our husbands and wives, on our boyfriends, girlfriends, that we really understand and we try to think what will make them feel loved and stop worrying about what will make us feel loved. Because if we can do that, you're going to come in behind us and do an amazing thing. And you're going to grow agape love, which is your love, God, which is unconditional love. And it can only be grown with you. It only exists with you. But it can very, very much exist in our marriages as we stop thinking about ourselves and focus on you and focus on the other. Would you do that tonight, Lord? Give us all good rest. Bring us back together next week. In Jesus' name, amen.